And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the first game that I ever, that I ever reviewed, Heroes Against Darkness, as well as Hero Kids, the Forge Engine, and now Onyx Sky, the one and only Justin Halliday, who arrived just in time. Sorry, couldn't help myself. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight? <laughs> I'm I'm good, yeah. Like I'm I'm like uh, however many hours behind you or ahead of you. So I I cannot complain. Um, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Mildred. Thank thank you for coming on. Um, so I'd like to I'd like to open a bit with the humble beginnings, as is tradition around here. Well, one of the main traditions. The other one is the drinking. Um, with that with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick. God, this is probably a lot like a lot of people's um, first experiences. I am I am of an age, or probably almost as old as D and D. I can't remember how to, how old exactly D and D is, but I'm probably almost as old as it. Um, but I think um, down here in Australia, where where I live, um, my brother had my older brother. He would have been, you know, twelve or thirteen. You know, mm-hmm. and I I idolized him at the time. He, you know, he had picked up D and D from somewhere. Um, and you know, for him, it was kind of this, you know, this thing that he dabbled with a little bit. We played a few games together. He lost interest, but I stayed interested. Um, and then I, I think in, um, that was probably like late primary school here, which is up to about year six. Um, and then going into what, again, high school for us from year seven to 12, um, I, I would, you know, play a few games of D and D with some friends in high school, um, and it was kind of that thing where at the time, you know, like there were lots of people who played D&D in different groups. And it it was that weirdness where, you know, for example, we were really bad at playing D&D here because, you know, we didn't always know, um, you know, the kind of, we didn't have the full spectrum of um, the social groups around which D&D would be propagated, like how to play it properly. So, you know, we did goofy shit like um oh sorry hopefully i can swear i'm not sure um, no sw- swearing is swearing is perfectly fine here in the temple we do n- we do not curtail people's language great just checking so goofy shit like going through the modules not playing them but just picking out all the treasure and adding them to our characters um and i remember one time i, I must have been in, in about um uh you know, late high school, um, again, for us, I would have been about 17 or something. There was, there was this other guy who, um, you know, we, we didn't play in a game together. But he's like, he's like, oh, you know, my character's so high level. I give your character a, a diamond um, worth a million gold pieces, um, which, you know, automatically, like, leveled my character up, like, 20 levels or some ridiculous thing. Um, so we played D and D for a long time, and and out of high school, I joined a um a gaming group that came out of a um, a you know a computer kind of group, um, and I played with um that group, on and off, for, thirty years pretty much, um until very recently, which is you know there's a whole story about that, which is boring because it's grown up stuff where it just became too far to travel, and I started a new group closer to home, mm-hmm. um but they're you know still great great friends of mine. Um, and the only gap kind of in that, so in that, in that time we, we played, you know, we would have played basic D and D and then second edition and then third edition. And then we, um, and then there was a period there where we played, uh, you know, in around third and fourth edition where we played a shitload of magic, the gathering. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, as it turns out, you know, one of our, one of our group, um, owned a gaming shop at that point. So we would get a lot of gaming cards. And so we, we uh, sorry, a lot of magic cards. And um, at one stage, um, I had a magic collection of, of cards um, and my house got broken into uh, and th- they stole my magic cards among a bunch of other stuff. God knows why. Um, but I ended up getting like, you know, $5,000 back from the insurance for my, for my magic cards, which, you know, had a bunch of kind of rares and stuff in them. Nothing mm-hmm. special, like no moxes or whatever they are and those sorts of things. Um, 
but at that point i was like okay i'm done with magic right i've got my money back on my investment so i'm done with magic i'm just gonna, i'm gonna go back to role playing and we went back to um you know to fourth edition and i think we played and and we played fourth edition for a while but we got into um the thing which happened with fourth edition which is it got very slow um and and around that time you know i also in between all this i worked in the video game industry doing game design mm -hmm. so I would do game design during the day and then we would role play, you know, once a week at night. And then um, in playing fourth edition, I was kind of, I don't know, I must have been unsatisfied at work with the, with the design aspects, but I decided, or I had a lot of time on my hands at work. I decided, okay, I'm going to, you know, I want to, I like the, I like the mechanical aspects of fourth edition, but I don't like where it went. So I, at that time decided, okay, I want to, like a lot of people did actually, 13th age and, um, whatever the other one is, it's like thirteenth age, um, which I can't remember right now. Um, um, but, there, there's you know, a couple. There's a couple. I, there's a couple I can think of um, in, ter in terms of hacking for in terms of, of hacking fourth edition yeah, in that regard. And third and yeah. Um, so, um, Unchained Heroes is one. Stri um, strike yeah. is the strike is the other. Yeah, strike is very fourth edition, right? Mm -hmm. there was another one that's like 13th age that's uh anyway anyway i decided like like those guys i'm gonna i want to you know i'm gonna design my own d20 game and it's gonna be better than d20 which everyone does it's a rite of passage mm -hmm. for young designers don't hold it against me um uh so i i thought okay i'll i wanted um a game that is that has some of the mechanical kind of robustness of fourth edition but strips away a lot of the um complexity of it so that it plays faster and um, unlike fourth edition, where um, as the game gets, you know, as you get higher level, it kind of slows down. Um, mm -hmm. You know, which there's a lot of things to talk about fifth edition there. But I wanted a game that um, didn't slow down at higher levels. So you know, I introduced things like, you know, like scaling damage and scaling spells, and you know, I I do I did what just about everyone does. You know, I got rid of fancy and magic, and I had spell points, which I called anima and. Um, you know, I just wanted to do something different with it to see mm -hmm. how you could take that D, D20 kind of engine and really kind of strip it back, um, but also exploring, you know, what it means to be a spell. You know, can you have spells that are scalable? So I had, scale, you know, um, uh, it had scalable spells in it, like you could put in, um, you know, extra energy into your spells. You know, a lot like the the proto fifth editions do. Not the saying that I invented that, but you know, there was lots of that stuff in the zeitgeist. Um, you know, uh, at the time, and I think it's always a really interesting kind of design space to try to, you know, see what see what D and D is doing and see how other people are using that kind of D twenty kind of chassis mm -hmm. and and doing different sorts of games with it. Yeah. Now, with with that in with that in mind, um, I did want to touch. I did want to touch a little bit on some aspects of Heroes Against Darkness because when I um, when I found mm -hmm. when I found it, um, that was around that was around the same time that um, D and D Next was going about, and I had my own um, frustrations with with the direction that that went. <clears throat> um, I don't want to go. I don't want to go too into the details, but suffice to say, the um, I felt that they were introducing good ideas and then killing them off. Um, a very piezo, a very piezo thing, if you ask me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And, but one, but one, but the the big th the big thing that I don't that I don't that drew me to that and drew me to Thirteenth Age sometime later was them following through on something that was that was billed to me when thir when um D and D next came about, that being a uniting of the editions. Um mm. and in, fa in fact in the early days of fifth edition people were calling that the greatest hits of the previous editions, which um I still to this day find kind of suspect. Um especially especially given that a greatest hits album is not ex is not exactly the most cohesive. If you listen to if you look yeah. at a greatest hits album of um any band and yeah with with that with that kind of thing in mind i do remember there i do remember there was the um there was the blog post on your old blog that 
went through each edition and what aspect you were t what aspect you were taking from it was was the goal initially to just be a response to certain things in fourth edition or was the goal to always um have these elements from each edition um a bit of both so the one thing i could get away with um in heroes against darkness that dnd fifth edition couldn't which is killing sacred cows um so you know dnd fifth edition still has hit dice and it still has um you know magic missile and fireball and you know all these sorts of things so it's they they're almost so entrenched in D D um that it has to kind of keep them um whereas in you know in um heroes against darkness i wanted to you know keep kind of um kind of the the simplicity of the earlier editions like basic and those sorts of things um i wanted to streamline things like for example proficiencies um and i also wanted to bring some of the modern kind of ideas of unified um you know single the unified engine of a single mechanical role um in it um and you know um i think i picked up from fourth edition for example having several defenses um as well rather than having saving throws and attack rolls as two separate things so mm -hmm. i think you know as, as i said i was able to get rid of the sacred cows that i think D, &D still hasn't the one regret i have actually with um with uh with um heroes against darkness is that i didn't get rid of attribute scores um you know among among many regrets across my life um the one for that is and if i ever if i ever did another one which i, I don't plan on doing i would get rid of attribute scores as well because you know to me they're just uh, an an intermediary step that is unnecessary and forms you know has no function i know no no there are some systems that use them they use a you know roll under your attribute score which works until you get to 20 or so um uh, they use attribute scores in an interesting way but in D, &D they're just this kind of vested vestigial kind of you know appendix of the game where um where whatever whatever use they used to have mm -hmm. um is no longer there but they're so entrenched in the game that they can't get rid of them you know it has to be from three to 18 to 20 um you know but also when they were doing D, &D next and i can't I'm trying to remember when D&D Next came out, you know, when the first... Because I, um, you know, I, I kind of um, did all of the play tests for D&D Next as well. A bit like, you know, you did... You were talking about um, organised play. Um, my buddy who ran a magic, magic store, a gaming store at that time, um, they were just getting started up. And I said to him, hey, do you want... You know, how about I run um, I run D&D here? And it was back when it was still running D&D Encounters, like in 4th edition... Mm -hmm. So I ran a bunch of seasons of fourth edition and I built up, you know, I built this up from me sitting there at a, at a table and no one showing up um, to when, when I kind of um, handed that over, we had nights where we'd have a hundred people showing up um, and we'd have, you know, 10, 15 DMs at all of these tables um, running it. It was just, you know, that was, that was a great experience. And that was um, from fourth edition through D and D next, and through the first few seasons of um, of the um, you know Adventurers League, um, which it became um, mm -hmm. at that point, um, which is kind of a long way of saying that um, that I went on that journey of seeing as you did um, how they approached um, how they approached the the playtest of D and D Next, um, mm -hmm. and some of the things that they changed, some of the things that they threw out along the way that were disappointing, you know, and and some of the things that just were always there or just crept in right at the last minute um but it feels like to me that they also um as D, D next was a big reaction as well to fourth edition in as much as they threw a lot of the baby out with the bathwater with fourth edition because while there's a lot of fourth edition in D, D next they threw out some things that they probably should have kept but they probably couldn't because um you know because of the backlash against D and D next, uh, D and, of course, I um, I remember, I remember, I remember remarking at the time that it, fe it felt like um, any anything that was anything that wasn't deemed classic enough would cause them to run away screaming, like 
like a um, like like a like the girl in a slasher fic. <laughs> yeah. Um. Now the er well, the earliest the Go on. the earliest version of ne of next that I have in my archives was in August two thousand twelve. Um. But when it came when. Like the big, the big one, for the the big, um, the big sticking point that that I never, that I never, I never let slide when it came to the when it came to things that got changed was um was the maneuver dice. Now they took what could have been a what could have been a fascinating idea to give martial characters something to do, and just and just turned that into a gimmick for one subclass. Yeah. Oh. Which is the only interesting, uh, you know, martial class. Uh, you know, uh, like I, I quite like. Uh, sorry, not the champion, which I'm the battle master, right? Like, yeah, you know, if I, I, I play, you know, I'm pretty boring, right? I play, I play when I play D and D. I play the battle master or I play a cleric. Like, you know, I, I want to hit things and I want to, and I want something interesting to do while I hit things. I think mm -hmm. is, you know, is my kind of style. And. Well, I've uh, I um, I've got I've gotten my I've gotten myself in a fair share of trouble for, um, t for taking my shots at tr at the traditionalist mindset regarding s regarding some <laughs> some and some and some entries, especially since I have the gall to actually make fighters interesting. Um, that <laughs> make that makes well, me that, was... uh, that makes me a her that makes me a heretic. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that was that was the th that again. That was a good thing that D and D um, fourth edition did, right? It made fighters interesting, and you can see that in the in the battle master, um, you know, with the maneuvers they have. But you can see that not in the champion fighter, which you know just hits the... is a is a crit fisher. That's all. That's all that the champion fighter is is just is just fishing for crits to the point. It's yeah. doing so much fishing. I think it. I think it's probably um, it's probably has to deal with re with regulation from the DNR. <laughs> um, but um, one of the, one of the key things that I that I end up say, that I end up saying when it came to all these things that were being brought in from pre brought in from previous editions is, yeah, you brought is um you brought it in, but it seems it seems like you missed why those things were introduced to begin with. I likened it to mm. a um to a par to a parent getting to a kid wanting wanting a um wanting a Disney princess for 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 christmas and get and getting an action figure of princess leia you're technically correct but you kind of missed the point only through acquisitions are you correct i guess um yeah yeah you know and and i don't I, you know there's a whole discussion here about what whatever they did right mm -hmm. it has been vastly successful you know comparatively um, you know, so mm -hmm. like, who am I to criticize? You know, <laughs> like I'm just some guy. So um, you know, I um, like guys. Like, although you know. when I, whenever that whenever that kind of thing is br brought up, I'll I'll usually say the transformer the 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 Bayformers movies are 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 successful, and and yet that doesn't stop people from criticizing them every time. Yeah, well, that that is true because you know with that with. And, and I think this is the same sides, of, two sides of exactly that same coin, right? They're, it's popular because, in a lot of the ways, it it captured all of the um, the you know not the cliches, but you know all of the things that D and D is known for. You know whether it is the fireball, whether it is you know the the particular quintessential aspects of particular characters. And I don't think that um, you know I'm not sure that the the lay person on the street cares about the stuff that you and i care about um and you know it, it, hopefully um you know hopefully hopefully they graduate from D, &D right i um you know I've, I've, I've got this situation where my 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 kids now mm -hmm. like I, I played hero kids with them for years and now like outside like just spontaneously they're playing D, &D with you know like with other kids like it's now a thing again like it was when i was a kid mm -hmm. um but but it's not you know it's not geeky like it was when we were geek when when i was a kid anyway you know maybe it's stranger things maybe it's critical role maybe it's all of this stuff um but it's it's resurgent in in the um in the culture 
Yeah, although um, I do have I do have qu I do have questions about this resurgence, um, long long term because what I'm because what I'm seeing mm -hmm. what I'm seeing right now feels very reminiscent of that um of that OGL bubble in the two thousands. Yeah, well, that's the risk, right? Isn't it that that they won't take? Um, you know, you know. I think that, uh, the, well, there's there's a whole other discussion here about you know um, what is the what are the current bubbles in in gaming. You know, when you see, you know, the popularity of Critical Role. I think right now, you know, as we are recording this, I think there's a there's a um, Kickstarter for an Avatar, um, the Last Airbender. Yeah, I've, I've got... that is the most successful um, Kickstarter of all time. Yeah, and when it comes when it comes games, to the... that is. I um I've cov I've covered that particular entry a cup a couple times and I've been very crit I've been very critical of what they're put of what they're putting out simply because um the um mm. do doing an avatar TRPG is not new since fans have been doing that for for a decade um but as far as mm. far as how much as far as how much money that's raked in the qu the question that I ended up having is how many of those people are actually going to play and how many people are are um, just fans who are going to use it as a coffee table book. Yeah, and how how many disappointed people is it going to leave when, you know, obviously, um, you know, it's powered by the apocalypse, so it's a very different kind of focus on on how the game runs. So who knows, right? How mm -hmm. much is it selling oh. on the on the name? Um, but we're, but we're off the topic of yeah. D and D. Get, getting <laughs> so getting back, I, getting back to this. getting back to the ra getting back to the rails of things. There was there was one thing in Heroes mm. Against Darkness that I always wanted to ask about, and that is mm. within the book there were a handful of um, there was one hybrid class, the Hospitalier, and there were yeah, there were hints yeah. about other yeah. hi about other hybrid classes and how you could how you could make them. And what what uh, what they'd be hybrids of, but they weren't um, detailed. Um, what what was the reasoning for that? Just not just not enough time, or or something else. Like I remember Swordmaster being one of them. Right. Yeah. So I I will um you know behind the curtain uh, what happened is I wrote you know I wrote Heroes Against Darkness. Mm -hmm. um, it came out you know. I released it for free, by the way. It's mm -hmm. it's Creative Commons licensed. I so the 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 actual core cool rules are free. The um you can buy hardback and softback off Drive Through RPG. Mm -hmm. So I made no money off that game. Like you know, it's it's a work of of um you know it was a work of uh, design exercise and passion for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so what happened is that um uh I had kids um and i designed hero kids um and um hero kids was something really simple really straightforward um and to to be uh, super honest hero kids is vastly um more successful than anything else i've done in my entire life um it, it was the the right game at the, at the right time for the right audience you know mm -hmm. it was i don't know whether whether again this is in the zeitgeist right there were a bunch of older people who played D, &D when they were kids and they uh, and they just had kids because they were about my age or they were you know and they they wanted to play games with their kids mm -hmm. and when i released hero kids there were a couple of games out um there was D what's themselves released one called heroes of hesiod or something like that um, yeah, which was just a, a kind of a, a um, arena battle game using D twenty or three D six. It was really um, straightforward. Um, there was another one um, oh, at the time, which was really RPG Kids, um, mm -hmm. which was released before Hero Kids. Um, and props where it's due, RPG Kids by Enrique Enrique Bertram, who's like literally still around he's newbie dm i think um i think that's enrique anyway um i looked at heroes of hesiod i looked at rpg kids um i didn't like the mechanics of either of them they were presented really um you know really in a really basic manner and this is not a criticism at the time um and I just thought, okay, well, I'd, I'd like to, A, do another game, and I want to do a game that's much more straightforward. Um, 
Heroes Against Darkness took me like two or three years. It was, you know, over 100,000 words, way more than 100,000 words. It was a huge amount of effort. Um, so I figured I'd do something simple. And so I designed this game, Hero Kids. I play tested it with my own kids. I play tested it with other kids. And then I released it on um, Drive Through RPG. Um, and I released it with, you know, a few adventures and some, you know, expansions and stuff. Um, and I ended up winning a silver any for it that year. I was up against the Doctor Who RPG, um, which won the gold any. So, you know, um, and I'm like, I'm one guy. I work with um, uh, this artist called Eric Quigley, who did all the art. Um, he did the cover, he did the character art for it, um, and he's been a partner for me um, literally over the last almost 10 years as we've kept kind of working on Hero Kids. So, so in answer to your question why I didn't do those, um, those extra classes, um, I got distracted by another product that turned out to be um, much, more, uh, much more successful and there was much more um, push for content for it from people who, who were thirsting for content. Mm -hmm. So I spent, you know, five or so years, um, you know, writing adventures, making new characters for Hero Kids to the extent now that I've got over over 100 character, you know, characters for it. They're called heroes. They come on little cards, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's 15 or so adventures. We're now translating it into... I've got a, a community content program for it whereby... Um, other partners from around the world can translate um, the core game, the adventures and things, the characters into other languages. So we have Hero Kids is now in French, German, Italian, Spanish, Russian, Polish, you know, um, all, like it's, it's, um, it's a thing on its own and it, um, it continues to be popular. I, it's an evergreen game um, mm. at the moment. And, but it also means that I... Um, I am constantly in a, at a low level state of anxiety about um, having to keep work on, working on Hero Kids, um, which, you know, is, is both a great place to be, but also, you know, not such a great place to be. Oh, yeah. Now, with, with, that, kind, with that kind of thing in mind, um, after, yeah. the, after that came... came and that, or rather, rather parallel to that, in some cases, came the Forge engine, which was your, which was your attempt to do a more universal style of a, style of approach. Um, what pro what prompted that? Because it's it's a hell of a leap to go from two fa two fantasy adjacent games to a to a um to a universal style game. Yeah, look, you know, what was I thinking? Um, so, um, Forge Engine, by the way, took me a long time, um, and because I was doing it in parallel with um, with Hero Kids, mm -hmm. and I was um, play play testing, inflicting it on my gaming group um, as well. Because probably around that time, I became the full time GM for the for the group, which. Sadly for them meant that I chose what system we would run, which sadly for them meant I would play test games um, with them or on them. Mm -hmm. um, so what was I thinking? I was thinking, so basically, you know, um, behind the curtain again, Forge Engine is basically um, Hero Kids. Uh, don't tell anyone. Um, but it's opposed dice, like dice pool rolls. Um, and the dice pools scale um, higher. Um, they, they get bigger as you get stronger. Mm -hmm. um, and the opposed role is um, attack versus defense. The defense rolls their, their defense dice, and the highest of their die sets the um, target number. The attacker rolls their die, dice, and they usually have more in the attack dice. Mm -hmm. Any dice of the attackers that meets or beats the defender's highest dice is a success mm -hmm. um and and i so i thought okay well i, I want to make a grown-up game here and i want to make a game um you know th this became for me or at the start it started as an intellectual challenge for me i said to myself well, in a moment of delusion probably i said i want to make a game where where the action economy itself is entirely um 
uh, it's not preset, right? So basically it has an energy economy, which, you know, lots of other games have tried to do as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I just had to go through the exercise of working out how to get there like they did. So I said, okay, I want you to have energy and any action you choose to do, whether it's hitting someone with a sword, casting a spell, um, moving, um, you know, uh, interacting with other objects, um, doing attribute tests, um, any action you take, regardless of what it is, um, you just pull out of your energy pool and your energy is your capacity for action um, mm -hmm. at any particular time. So what this, um, what this means is that, um, is that uh, basically you can, instead of having what D&D has, which is a fairly strict action economy of you have one primary action, one move action, and, you know, your minor action, D and D um, fourth edition. I think you had your your uh, um, your major, your move, your minor, and so I think there was a fourth Sta one. Standard a... move, minor, free. Free, yeah. So, you know, instead of having those kinds of um, that kind of action economy, I wanted to um, allow you to have total freedom. You could do, if you have the energy to do it, you can do two, three standard actions. You can hit. Like if you have the energy, um, you can hit a guy three times with your sword, mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. And as your character develops, as your attributes grow, because in the game you get better by increasing your attributes each time your attributes, um, it, it, sorry, your energy pool in, in Forge Engine, I should, I should mention here, is determined by your three highest attributes. And it uses effectively like a kind of a... Um, a vampire style, um, you know, dots like mm -hmm. um, for each of your attributes. So one dot in an attribute or one rating, it's called in that, is like um, below average, two is average, and then three, four, five are um, above average. So if you have four, um, four ratings in strength um, and three in wisdom and, you know, three in something else, you might have 10 energy in your energy pool. Mm -hmm. um, so then you can choose, okay, I want to choose, I wanna sp I'm going to spend four energy moving up towards them, and then I'm going to save behind, well, I'm going to use six energy to make, no, not six energy, I'm going to move, use another four energy to make a really strong attack against them, and then I'm going to hold back two energy as well, so that I can defend myself off turn, mm -hmm. because the other thing you could do is you could hold back some of your energy so you can bolster your defenses. Um, the other thing I tried to do as well with it is concurrent turns. So while you had energy, any time you had energy um, left in your energy pool, you could choose to use an action, um, you know, in between other people's actions on the turn. Um, so it ended up being um, intellectually, um, intellectually sophisticated, but um, probably complex in, in practice, mm -hmm. um, which... You know, at the time, um, for me, again, as an exercise, I think I, I, I really worked through, all, <laughs> I worked through a lot of issues with that game. Um, but, uh, but in the end, I think it, it's, you know, it, it achieved what it set out to do. And I think it's a really great benchmark to say to people who say, I want to make a game with an energy system that allows you to have a completely um, free action economy. It's a great game to point to and say, this is where that thinking might lead you um, and um, think about the choices you're making. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we played for, you know, we played countless, um, well, not countless, we played a ton of campaigns in it um, and it became second nature, you know, it, like the freedom and that sort of thing. But it takes so much to, you know, um, engagement to grok. And this is where, you know, my games are, are different than, apart from hero kids they're different from dnd right dnd you you choose a thing you roll a d20 you hit or you miss mm -hmm. you know whereas the stuff that i make i think um you know i i back myself into some corners with um trying to be um trying to be a bit more flexible i guess mm -hmm. oh um flexibility is one of those things that comes with a cost um now with that one of the th one of the things that immediately stood out to me when I when I was looking over um, Forge Forge Engine and the like is um, 
is the whole using multiple di using multiple die sizes, which these days if, mm -hmm. these days if you play word association with with the whole using diff using multiple die types, a lot of people are gonna think of um, um, Savage Worlds. Um, was that was that an influence or is that coincidental? So, so, so Forge Engine was all D10, so it was D10 pools. Um, Onyx Sky mm -hmm. um, was is is um, step die system, uh, and and there's a jump there, right? Because I I released Forge Engine, and you know, as, as a you know, I'm I'm somewhat hopefully painfully aware of you know the 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 good and bad of all of my games hopefully mm -hmm. um what i wanted to do is i wanted to take the idea of forge engine that universality of it that free form aspect of the um of the um action economy and the um and the universal skills like the classless kind of skills and attributes design style which i wish mm -hmm. we had a better word for because we don't we have class-based design and then we have whatever is the opposite which i've taken to call in attributes plus skills style of design but i wish it had a name that isn't classless design um anyway that's an aside um but what i wanted to do was okay i, I was thinking okay how can i take um forge engine and these scaling dice you know the the increasing numbers of dice in the dice pool and make it more manageable and streamlined um so that you you're using fewer dice mm -hmm. um but you're getting the same escalating um results in it um and uh as you say no one no, nothing's new under the sun right like savage mm -hmm. worlds does it um there's a game called iron something iron claw which is like mm -hmm. a, a furry kind of um, yeah furry game yeah does I, it iron, um, claw, iron claw and um jade claw um yeah and i think i think cortex does it but they all do it yeah. in different ways mm -hmm. and the one thing that kind of bugged me around um savage worlds is look no one i don't think anyone here is a big fan of the d4 as a dice um certainly not a fan of stepping on it um so, no exactly you know uh savage worlds goes from d4 to d12 and, and they the they do that you know because that's the good spread of dice right because after d12 in you know and this is probably you know we can blame either um uh gary or we can blame um we can blame um platonic solids for having no d16 in our standard set of dice um so i decided early on uh to 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 bite the bullet and and use d16s in um onyx sky mm -hmm. as a um as a one of the die steps um and you know if you're an enthusiastic kind of um, collector of dice um I, it also uses d24s and d30s um if you happen to get there um and the idea was that basically that progression of dice is a very smooth escalation of increments um from so so onyx sky goes six eight ten twelve sixteen twenty and then you can go up beyond that if you want if your character develops mm -hmm. um and the design goal of doing that was to um it means that your attribute in onyx sky we, we're talking now about the onyx sky system obviously which um again attributes and skills your attribute is represented by one die as your attribute gets better you step that die up to you know like you know you start at d6 it goes to d8 it's about an average person d10 12 16 20. um mm -hmm. and what i did in onyx sky and and what you probably might have tweaked here is that um onyx sky is built on you can describe it as being built on the same chassis as forge engine almost you can see a lot of uh, um forge engine in onyx sky mm -hmm. um in how in how it it is classless you if you look at the martial skills they're very similar um you know because they are the sorts of things that the battle master um and fourth edition um make interesting um you know make for interesting choices in combat um so again the idea of onyx sky is your attribute die escalates um as you get better mm -hmm. and then if you have a skill that matches it right um you 
get a matching die in that skill. So again, the difference in, in Forge Engine, you used to be able to rank up your skills independently of your attribute, but they could only go up to your attribute. In Onyx Sky, the um, the change there. So if you, if I'm talking too much design theory, mm. let me know because I can boy. Um, the 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 idea in, Does... in Forge Engine is is uh, I haven't let you butt in because I'm going to finish this thought. But yeah. the, the idea in Forge Engine is that the skills are just an on-off thing, right? You either mm. have a skill or you don't. It doesn't have ranks in it. If you have a skill, instead of just having your attribute die, you have an your attribute die and another version of the same die. Um, so if you had a D16 and an attribute for an attribute test, say you're doing athletic, uh, you know, strength athletics, you just and you've only got strength, you just roll a D16. Mm -hmm. If you have the athletic skill as well, you roll two D16s. And um, in Onyx Sky, it also introduces the idea of these specializations. So you might have a third die because you have, um, you know, uh, strength. Obviously, everyone has strength. You might have the uh, athletic skill. Then you might have another specialization in running or swimming or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's kind of niche there. Um, so the idea was, okay, how can I take Forge Engine, make it much more simple and straightforward while preserving the freedom that characters have, mm -hmm. uh, that players have about their characters? And... Speaking speaking of that, whenever whenever a game uses a heavy uses a heavy um, amount of skills, especially especially mm -hmm. especially if um expe especially if it's on a point based expenditure, there's always the mm -hmm. risk of analysis paralysis, as it as it's called. Um, and as much as I as much as I love it, um, Shadowrun is one is one of my big offenders when it comes to this kind of thing. As as anyone who's mm. seen the skill list in any in the last few editions of Shadowrun will tell you, but yeah. in, but when it comes when it comes to that, how do you how do you mitigate that particular issue so you so you don't have pe you don't have people angsting over whether or not um, their spread of skills what in the most in the generic and the specialized versions um, ends up ends up biting them on the ass after after a few sessions. So many great parts. So many great aspects. So much meat in that in that question. Mm -hmm. So, um, the first thing that we do is we um, okay. How do we make sure that people don't get caught up too much in analysis paralysis? One of the rules that I have for um, for game theory wise again is that there are no um, prerequisites for skills. So, I I don't. There, there are no build trees in mm -hmm. Forge Engine or in Onyx Sky. So what it means is that um is that there are no um no there are no decisions that you make a character creation that you will regret later on because they gated you out of a particular build because you built it wrong early on. One of the things that I picked up from fourth edition, for example, is skill retraining. So in Onyx Sky um, anytime you um, buy a new skill, you can switch out one of your other skills. So if you do have regrets, you know, you can for free rub out a skill that you chose earlier and just replace it with a different one. Mm -hmm. um, again, no, no regrets. Um, the other aspect is that all skills cost the same amount of character points. So you're not having to weigh up the value of them as much. In the, in the skills themselves, each one... Um, each little atomic skill um, costs the same. So some might be actually more valuable than others, but they try to mitigate that through the design, the, the size of the design bubble that each of them kind of occupies. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine, um, you know, you see this in 5th edition actually where they try to introduce feats and they're like, well, this feat is kind of ball, so I have to give you like a half character point with it as well. Um, you know, that sort of that sort of thing. So in 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 onyx sky what i try to do is when i design a um a combat skill like what we call a, a specialized martial skill um we try to make it um atomic the the size of its design space all comparable to the others they're not always going to be comparable um but also the other aspect is you can 
you know, you can buy, you know, when you play Onyx Sky, every session you get six character points. Skills cost four character points. Mm -hmm. Every session you can get a new skill or you can save up for a couple of sessions and get three skills or you can save up even longer and increase your attributes. So um, the the design intent there was to balance that thing of, okay, um, people should have a lot of skills, um, but they should have some tension between saving up to buy attributes, but attributes get more expensive over time. Mm -hmm. So eventually the character's kind of going to top out on the attributes and they're going to broaden out their skill sets over time because it, it becomes cheaper then to buy skills and increase your versatility um, across time. Um, and I think there was one other part of that. The, uh, the other part of it, um, the last part is how do we make it accessible accessible for people? So, and, and we do that by, well, I'm talking we, but you know, the royal we, we do that by um, having everything is based first on attributes. And here you go back to Savage Worlds. Savage Worlds, everything's based on skills. And if you don't have the skill, you fall back to your attribute. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Onyx Sky or in Forge Engine, everything is fundamentally an attribute test. And if you have the skill, you are better at the attribute test. You know, you, you get an extra die or in Forge Engine, you get more dice. Mm -hmm. But in um, Onyx Sky, you get an extra dice. Um, and then, so there's this idea of um, general skills and basic combat skills. So the player who's inexperienced can play the, you, A, you can play the entire game with attributes, but B, you can play the whole game with attributes and, and the basic combat skills, which is like melee weapons. So if, mm -hmm. you, if you go to hit someone with a melee weapon, you get an extra dice automatically. And this represents the analog here in D and D land is the proficiency bonus, right? It's your proficiency bonus with a weapon or a class of weapon. And then, once you're a bit more experienced in that, you might go, okay, well now I want to take flanking attack as a skill, as a, as a specialized skill, or I want to take, um, you know, in in combat situations, or I want to take one that, um, you know, a breaching attack which staggers my um, opponent, or I want to take aimed attack so i can you know i can you know pre-aim at them and i'll get an extra dice or i want to take sneak attack so that if they can't steam me i get an extra dice so what you can do is you can your the character builds in onyx sky are a collection of these um you know um general skills which are the non-combat ones mm -hmm. and the martial skills um and that differentiates the different characters so some of them will be that kind of sneaky snipery sort of thing some of them will be the fightery sort of thing. Some will try to um, knock people to the ground and, you know, finish them off on the ground. Some will try to slow them down. Some will, um, you know, tank against them. There's, you know, there's other, other um, martial skills, for example, where you can, where you can um, order one of your allies to attack and they attack with effectively your dice. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's... Um, the, so the idea again is that um, for a beginner player, you can play at a superficial level. For a um, you know for an experienced you know tactical player, they can play with all of these permutations of the um, specialized martial skills and see all these interesting um, or have all these interesting choices in combat um, and also interesting choices in you know non-combat situations, whether it's role playing encounters or you know. Um, just exploration as well. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of speaking of that, when it comes to Onyx Sky, that is a po that is a post-apocalypse style of, style of game. And mm -hmm. one of the th one of the things that uh, one of the things that I'm curious about is, on one hand, taking the Forge engine and and um tw and tweaking it towards that towards that particular genre, and two, what a what what about um? What would you say is what would you say is the draw of doing a post-apocalyptic um, role-playing game? Um, so when we were playtesting Forge Engine, um, we played a whole bunch of different uh, genres through it, and one of my, I don't know why, like there's a whole bunch of psychology in this at the moment. I'm obsessed with post-apocalyptic um, fiction and post-apocalyptic stories um i don't know maybe it's the zeitgeist again like you know has anyone looked outside lately 
um, you know, when we've got uh, polar vortexes and, you know, heat domes and, you know, um, you know a pandemic, um, societal unrest, all these sorts of things. Um, but, uh, but the other aspect of post-apocalyptic that appealed to me is that um, post-apocalyptic games give you a breadth of, um, of game, possible game mechanics in them that is almost second to none because they span effectively um, contemporary modern play, like where you might have firearms in them, all the way through to kind of medieval fantasy style that we have. Mm -hmm. Now, I personally don't do kind of gonzo post-apocalyptic, but some people do, you know, with, you know, mutant creatures and, um, you know, um, spell-like abilities. Um, Onyx Sky is strictly in the grounded post-apocalyptic, you know. It's more along the lines of Twilight 2000 than Gamma World, for example. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, but as a design exercise, though, a post-apocalyptic... Um, genre is a really great test bed for whether your game can scale from fantasy to contemporary to beyond to sci-fi sort of um, settings as well and that's what i used it for in um onyx sky uh, sorry on onyx sky, in forge engine mm -hmm. so i used post-apocalyptic to test those things i we also did a bunch of um you know we did a um we did on on forge engine we did a campaign where they started out as um world war ii soldiers um they got captured by nazis they got sacrificed in an in a nazi occult um uh ritual and they got sent back um two thousand years to um roman occupied gaul um same characters and this was in this was a way of me testing out okay how do i take you know a character that how do, does it work if i take a character who's built for modern day or effectively modern day it was world war ii in forge engine does that character also work in in a medieval setting or a, you know a um you know a historical setting and the answer was yes with all the interesting things of okay where well, they come with their skills um you know you might notice in in onyx sky um apparently i like portal fantasy as well in onyx sky um it has so, sort of this almost this meta plot in it where um your characters in Onyx Sky are probably unknown to the to the to the players themselves. Um, at, at some point during a global, um, you know, nuclear, you know, world war, they retreat into their bunkers. Mm -hmm. You know, whether they're military, whether they're you know um, preppers, whether they're uh, some you know rich people living in their enclave, whether they're um, kind of astronauts up on the ISS, um, you know. Um, marines uh submariners in submarines whether they're scientists in a um in a vault they go into their their um their bunker their vault their facility whatever and they get and they spend a whole generation in there and it, it, this is a bit like fallout uh, mm -hmm. you know as well so what it, but, but again they come out into the world not knowing what the world is so when you the idea of of onyx sky is when you come out into the world the world is, um, it's, it's kind of not a known ap apocalypse to you. You're coming out and you're wondering, you're exploring and you're discovering the world as the player and as a character at the same time. Um, so, and, and to me that was really appealing as well mm -hmm. because at the same time, what the, then the players start um, experiencing this very different world where they're, where um, they they might see things that you know they think uh, you know um, they might see injustice they might see persecution they might see you know warlords they might see you know um, the kinds of things that their characters with kind of this thirty year gap uh, where they they might have kind of contemporary now expectation and morals and um, you know expectations when they come out they're in a world where they're like fish out of water um and the um the, the question of the game is okay you know you know in a world which where you pull away that scaffolding of all of society that we have now you know whether it's the government or law and order or you know jobs and all these structures you know television and things once you pull all that away 
what are the things that are acceptable to you um and what how do you how do you live in that world where it's where you know you're making decisions about whether the people live or die by mm-hmm. your actions um so that was you know there's all this kind of lifeboat ethics and those sorts of aspects of um onyx sky that i worked through myself in designing the game yeah um i will i will admit that when you meant when you mentioned multiple um t- multiple tech levels and and the like when it comes to, when it comes to a post apocalypse um one of the one of the big mm. things that came to that popped up in the back of my head in that regard is the genesis um specifically the genesis rebirth although yep. although and while that's technically post apocalyptic it isn't because of a nuke it's because it's because of um mutants from a meteor a fungus or something yeah so you know i i only i only discovered degenesis you know a little while ago and mm-hmm. um a it's beautiful and it scares me in its beauty like you know my god um but b i find one, one of the things i tried to do with onyx sky was mm-hmm. um was make it really approachable um i i often find when i pick up a game you know, I've got um, I've got red markets here, for example, mm-hmm. and you know I followed all the red markets development through the course of um, you know the role playing public radio kind of um, podcast on it while Caleb was designing it. You know, and I was hugely enthusiastic about it, and you know I've listened to all of their actual plays and things, and I love it. But I got the book, and I picked up the book, and it's got like two hundred pages of backstory in it, um, and I don't know, like I don't have I don't have time to read that. Um, I don't, you know, I, I, and so with Onyx Sky, what I wanted to do was give people a game that is as, as tight as possible. And, you know, it's, I think it's Onyx Sky, the final version is 180 page kind of PDF. Um, it's kind of an all in one PDF, you know, for all the game master stuff, monster, you know, an adversary kind of, um, bestiary in there as well um and and then so so as i was designing it my goal was at each point okay what are the um what are the things i need to put in this bucket for a game master to be able to you know a a fairly improvisational game master i'm a fairly improvisational game master so i'm expecting people to be fairly improvisational about it to be able to have enough grist like have enough ideas in here that they can run a campaign so you know instead of it having a a baked in um storyline um it has like it has some guidance um in the book about how to structure a story your own story you know when you introduce the nemesis what are the kind of stages of a story that you would see um and then it has a bunch of suggestions for what the end game might be but mm-hmm. it doesn't dictate that. And then it has a whole shitload of um, encounter seeds and adventure seeds in there as well. Um, and, you know, then it has um, different factions and different, you know, companion archetypes and those sorts of things. So it's really like um, a toolkit, you know, like it's mm-hmm. a big toolkit. That, and, and when I say big, what I, what I mean is also not big because each one of them is like a bullet point paragraph and you can, you know, you can read through it. You just flick open to a page um, and you see, you know, you scan down a page, you know, hopefully an hour before your game or 15 mm-hmm. minutes before your game. Mm-hmm. And you you get inspired by the different things, um, you know, which is, uh, you know, I, again, time poor people, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to have to read 170 pages of the backstory to be able to run a game. Um, I don't, I don't have that time anymore. So, mm-hmm. um so the idea was, okay, how can I make this really accessible to people? How can I make it, um, you know, simple for them to run? I get, you know, unlike Forge Engine, here I give them a full bestiary. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Forge Engine was universal and um, it was abstracted from its setting. Here, Onyx Sky, is the game is the setting. You know, you run a, you run an, although you could pull out the setting and run it anywhere, and you could pull out Onyx Sky system itself and run it as post-apocalyptic. I'm currently running it as um as a sci-fi game. Um, you can separate those items, but but when you but they they're designed together to work together. Um, again, because of that 
that um that leap that I wanted to help players make from here's an engine to here's a kind of engine and a story together that you can run a campaign with. Mm -hmm. And with that with that in mind, what would you say were what would you say have been some of the big um the big takeaways in 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 um the as far as the learning experience of developing Onyx Sky? Hmm. Um, you, so, what are the big takeaways of the learning experience? So, the, the big takeaways of Onyx Sky, one of the things I did in Onyx Sky, for example, is that I separated the energy system. Like, it's still got an energy system in it, mm -hmm. but I separated that from the core action economy. Um, uh, and this, this is so that it... Um, a, a, the energy system gets used in those specialized martial skills and it can get used in all sorts of ways through the game. Um, and it's also there, um, and, you know, this is from a design point of view, it's also there um, so that you can um, run things like magic in Onyx Sky mm -hmm. by using the energy system in it. Mm -hmm. um, what, so the takeaway here is games can always be simpler. Halfway through designing Onyx Sky, um, I redesigned it to make it simpler. I originally had... Um, I originally had um, a step dice for your attribute and then a separate step dice for each skill, like like in Forge Engine. I originally designed it so you had to rank up your skills um, uh, separately. I threw that away halfway through. It was too complicated and I redesigned it so that, um, so that each skill is just a tick box. Um, so I think that the, the, the lesson there is, um, you know, the system can always be simpler, but but also, you know, there comes a point where I'm maybe not interested in making that system. <laughs> but mm -hmm. you know, I, I you know these these things, I I design them for myself first, mm -hmm. um, and then I think about them for other people. Because if you're not designing for yourself, then you're just kind of, you know, you're trying to not pander, but you know, if I'm not satisfied with it then, you know, I've got to, there's no one else I need to satisfy other than me to make myself happy or, or, or live without regrets. Um, what, what other takeaways can we make from it? Um, it takes a long time to design a game, no matter how many times you've done it before. It took me two years to design Onyx Sky. Um, I do this fundamentally on my own. Um, you know, I have feedback from playtesters, but I, you know, I write... I write every word pretty much. Um, not that that's you know anything to be proud of. Um, um, you know, I do the I do the layout and that sort of stuff myself. So you know, I'm I'm really in that indie camp pretty heavily, um, and it takes time. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's the other thing. Like you know, you've got to give ideas time, um, psychologically to um, to just sit with them for a while, um, and you know, either go comfortable with them over time or to abandon them over time if they're not working. Um, what, other, what other ideas or what other lessons can we take away from this? I think I had one more, but now I can't remember it, so it can't have been important. It's not much of a lesson. Well, no, knowing knowing the luck of this, knowing the luck of my show, um, it'll probably come to you after the end after the end of the show, and then and then <laughs> you'll yell yell yeah. you'll yell at me. Oh, and why right. did you Why didn't you remind me about that? It's like. I'm not a mind reader. I'll have that one regret. That will be my one regret. Mm -hmm. uh, so actually, that's the other lesson of Onyx Sky. You know, I'm not. I'm not sure about. You know, um, I deli I deliberately don't do Kickstarters, but I mm -hmm. think that you know I, you know, I, Hero Kids funds all of my other RPGs, right? Like, the, the my other RPGs are like hobbies mm -hmm. that Hero Kids um, supports. <laughs> which is a weird way of thinking about it. Um, so, you know, I think that um, this one, you know, I think it since it's released, it has made back, and I'm using inverted commas here, it has made back the hard cash I put into it, i.e. paying artists and things. It probably hasn't made back the money. You know, I, I support a Patreon for a bunch of the art in the game. Mm -hmm. um, it's done by a fantastic guy called um, James Shields. Um uh, so a lot of my my um, art has come from that Patreon that I've supported now for many years. Um, 
but it's never going to pay for the hours that I that I put in. But also, I do this. Um, I do this so I can be creative. I used to work in video games, and I spent twenty years doing video games, um, being creative every day. And I still get to be creative in my job now, but it's not the same sort of creativity. So this is an outlet for that creativity, and it's a it's the ability to create something you know kind of tangible, mm -hmm. um, which isn't to say that you know I, I'm not sure whether I'm going to do another one, another game, or whether this is the you know this is the pinnacle or not, you know. Uh, um, but I I, I um, so the other the other thing that's come to me now. So the the other lesson was. Um, which I spoke about before, make a game that is that is tightly integrated with its with its own story, mm -hmm. um, which is what Onyx Sky is. So I deliberately set out um, at the start of this. Actually, I deliberately set out to make a really slim like game. I wanted to make you know like a sixty page game. Mm -hmm. I failed at that completely, um, <laughs> but I, I succeeded in I succeeded in making a game that is tightly cons tightly um linked in with its own story and gives hopefully the gm everything in the book that they need to run that story mm -hmm. hopefully. well i would with apart, the, with, from, the, apart mm, from the d16 which they have to provide themselves well um well you can well you can always you can always you, you can always use a random number range on excel um if if you want if well, you want to be cheap about every, it everyone's Everyone's online now, anyway, so you just get a dice roller that supports D sixteen, which is mm. what we've been using for you know since COVID hit. So it actually hasn't been an issue, <laughs> as it turns out. And oh, I'm um, if you can if you can find a D, I'm pretty sure there are there are already people who are who are making unironic one hundred sided dice. So yep. So there's um, still that. Un unironically, I think, unironically, there's an optional rule in um, in Onyx Sky, um, which uh, is for how you extend the dice. Um, I don't know. You this is you can see this because you're on camera, but the mm -hmm. people at home can't. There's an optional rule that takes the <laughs> dice all the way um, all the way to D100 mm -hmm. at the bottom, um, <laughs> which is it's nothing to be proud of. Okay, I'm I'm not proud. <laughs> Um, it really is a burden being right all the time. <laughs> I don't know who. Were you? Are you the? Uh, I should hook up with that D one hundred dice maker and have a special set made. I think <laughs> is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I'm. Sa I'm saying. Ta I'm saying. Take take the crazy and make it into an opportunity. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. That's what is what I'm here for, but. With with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and in, and um, indulge the madness around here. <laughs> Look, this has been amazing, and I, I I I welcome relish the opportunity for you to indulge my madness as well as we mm. talk some some pretty um some pretty uh, deep uh, design theory of of uh, why my games are like they are. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Lovely, lovely. Anytime you want to talk about kids' games, I've got a game to talk about. Um, but thank you so much for having me. It's been um, mm -hmm. such a great, uh, you know, way to spend uh, an evening and your morning uh, mm -hmm. together uh, drinking. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>